And now it gives me an enormous amount of pleasure to introduce an individual that needs no introduction. Mark is the co-creator of the Shared Value Business Management concept. He's a senior lecturer at the Harvard Business School. He's the author of many Harvard Business Reviews. And I had the privilege to not only be one of his students, but to also work with him for the last three years. Mark is authentic, and I want to share some little personal anecdotes about him. He became a grandfather this year to a beautiful little girl. He loves swimming with his wife, Nancy, and like a true millennial, he loves avocado on toast. So, and with that at hand, I hand you over to Professor Mark Kramer to talk to us about creating shared value in a time of crisis. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, Tiki. And um, good morning to everyone. Uh, I'm delighted to be able to be with you, uh, even if virtually. But I have to say I really miss the energy and inspiration that came from attending the Shared Value Africa Leadership Summit in person in previous years. It really is such an energizing and inspiring event. And uh, I'm sorry we can't be there together. Uh, but Tiki and her team has created an extraordinary program over the next couple of days. And I do thank you for joining us. I also want to uh, echo Tiki in, in thanking the sponsors, Old Mutual, Abbott, KCB, for making this possible. I do want to talk about this idea of creating shared value. But before I do that, I want to take a moment to just talk about this very strange and sad and painful moment in history that we are in right now. Uh, you know, I'm speaking to you from Santa Monica, California, where there have been a number of protests, as there are across the country, uh, kicked off by the death, the murder, really, of George, George Floyd, a black man in Minneapolis, at the hands of the police. It's quite remarkable to me that Musa Faki, the, the head of the Africa uh, Union Commission, uh, actually spoke out and uh, tweeted condemning this violence. It's not often we hear a condemnation from Africa about violence in America. And I, this has a very personal uh, connection for me. My wife and son were uh, at protests yesterday here where they were tear gassed by police. They're okay. But it is a very strange time. We've been told by the president tonight that he may activate the military to keep control and calm in the cities across the country. And of course, this is on top of the devastating, deadly coronavirus that has affected everyone in the world, creating not just disease and death, but leaving massive unemployment, hunger, poverty, and exposing the racial inequities and economic inequities that have been so painfully present for so long in our country and around the world. This is indeed a crisis that we are living through. And every crisis has the potential within it for new opportunity, for resilience and change. And I just want to pause a moment and ask a question through Slido, if we can put it up on the screen, please, question number one, and ask you for your opinion. After this crisis is over, when things eventually return to normal, do you think they will be the same or better or worse? So let's take a moment just to put the question up on the screen and to um, use Slido to respond.
while you're responding, let me just say that one of the things that has already come out of the crisis is some extraordinarily generous and thoughtful responses on the part of many businesses and companies. Old Mutual, for example, has committed hundreds of millions of rand to extend payments, provide free loans, to accelerate cash flow and provide payments to small businesses, and above all, to provide free health coverage and even death benefits for the healthcare providers who are the heroes on the front line. KCB has waived cash transfer fees. Vodacom is providing a platform for e-school learning. MTN is providing free textbooks. Unilever has contributed hundreds of millions of pounds of free hygiene supplies, uh, as well as accelerating its cash flow payments to the SMEs in its supply chain. Uh, Woolworths has been providing uh, protective equipment for workers. Abbott, of course, has been doing a tremendous amount developing testing and vaccines. Tiger Brands have been providing food relief for 100,000 people a day in South Africa. So it has been wonderful to see the generous responses of these companies. But of course, that's philanthropy and that is temporary. And while it is important and it is helping, it is not providing fundamental change. Over the past 10 years, Professor Michael Porter and I have gone around the world talking about this idea of creating shared value. And at every point, we have talked about how business and society depend upon each other. But I can say that I never thought I would see as graphic an example as we are living through today, where it is so painfully clear that business cannot survive without a healthy society and a healthy population where we cannot solve the problems that COVID has created without depending on private enterprise to provide the protective equipment, the medical care, the ventilators, everything we need, the vaccines, the tests that we need to deal with this crisis. And where it is also very clear that capitalism cannot survive without strong and good government. We often talk about capitalism as if it can take care of itself if government would just stay out of the way. But without the intervention of governments all over the world today, capitalism would have collapsed. And this idea that business and society and government all depend upon each other is central to this idea of creating shared value. And it sounds obvious. And yet, if you look at how many of us in society interact, we blame business for causing the problems. We don't think of it as a source of solutions. We blame government for regulating and interfering with business. We don't talk about the essential role it plays in managing and regulating capitalism. And we use our nonprofit sector, the NGOs, often to attack business for what they do wrong, rather than to collaborate with business. But we have seen that what we are doing doesn't work. If we ever thought our world and our society was resilient, we have been proved wrong. So how do we pivot? How do we rebuild so that when we do return to normal, it is a much better normal than the normal we have been living with before? Well, this idea of creating shared value is not a crisis response framework. It is a competitive strategy. It is a way of approaching business that increases the profitability of companies by helping to solve social and environmental problems. 
You know, we have been living in a world, in a version of normal, where we've been able to get away with superficiality. We've been able to claim that we're committed to the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals without actually changing anything we do. And yet we know business as usual is not going to get us to those goals. We've been able to publish wonderful sustainability reports, foundation reports, corporate social responsibility reports, talking about the wonderful things our companies have done, but never taken a hard look at our business model to see if we are actually making all of the stakeholders we touch better off. And I think what we have seen today is that the superficial answers we've been living with are not adequate to the world's needs. So shared value is not a crisis response framework, but it is a way of thinking about the role of business in society. It's really about finding business opportunity in solving social problems embracing a social purpose at the core of the business and treating all stakeholders in a way that leaves them better off because of their connection to your company. And that sounds very idealistic, a dream world that we'd love to have. But the reality is, in our research at Harvard Business School and in the work that the Africa Shared Value Leadership Summit does and the other shared value initiatives and projects around the world are doing, we are seeing example after example of companies that are improving their profitability and improving their competitive advantage by adopting a social purpose and by adopting a strategy to create shared value. So creating shared value is not about corporate responsibility. It's not about philanthropy. Those things are important. Corporations need to keep doing them. Shared value does not replace CSR. It does not replace philanthropy. But it is about how you operate and position your company. And let me give you just a couple examples. We talk about shared value as operating at three levels, and these three levels are really rooted in Professor Porter's well-known strategy frameworks. So the first level is about rethinking products and markets, and it's about how you can differentiate your company from competitors in a way that enables you to achieve superior profitability. And there is no better example than Discovery Life Insurance, Discovery Limited in South Africa, which is a life and health insurance company that has developed a very sophisticated set of financial incentives that lead their members to engage in healthier behavior, to buy healthier foods, to exercise more often, to get more regular checkups, to be more prudent about their spending, to be more careful in their driving. Everything they do that has a positive health impact earns them rewards. Rewards from upgrades on airlines to free movie tickets to all kinds of rewards that actually incentivize people to change behavior. And as a result, Discovery has 15% lower healthcare costs for its members and its members live almost 10 years longer on average, which if you are writing life insurance, makes your life insurance more profitable. And it's really about stepping back and saying, you know, the life insurance business model, which was developed hundreds of years ago, is about spreading risk. But hundreds of years ago, we didn't know that how you live your life, the choices you make of what to eat, whether to exercise, actually affect your life expectancy. We know that really well today but most life insurance companies around the world have not changed their model. Discovery has said, based on what we know today, 
we cannot just spread risk, we can reduce risk. We can make people healthier and thereby be more profitable. And fundamentally, they are in a different business than every other life and health insurance company in the world because they are actually reducing risk for their members in a way that increases their profitability. There's a second level of creating shared value, which is to look at productivity in your supply chain. You know, for a long time, we thought the less pe you pay people, your employees, the more profit you make. Well, there's really good research now coming out of MIT and other places around the world that shows that if you give people good salaries with good benefits and a sense of responsibility and autonomy and pride in their work, they are hugely more productive. And we have seen companies reduce their turnover costs and their training costs dramatically by paying people more. Walmart, the largest company in the world with millions of employees, gave all of their hourly and entry-level employees a substantial raise and they actually saved money because the productivity increased and the turnover decreased. So that's thinking about your stakeholders in terms of your employees and your suppliers. The third level of creating shared value is really about strengthening the communities in which you operate. And there's a wonderful example from Tanzania where Yara, a Norwegian company that sells fertilizers mostly to smallhold farmers, realized that there were all kinds of barriers preventing smallhold farmers from succeeding. And so they actually brought together about 70 different companies that all were involved in the agricultural supply chain, along with the government of Tanzania, the Minister of Agriculture, along with the World Bank and the Gates Foundation and the Rockefeller Foundation, and they came up with a comprehensive plan to create a successful agricultural cluster in Tanzania, lifting two million smallhold farmers out of poverty and creating a much stronger market for them to sell their insurance. Uh, excuse me, for their, them to sell their fertilizer. What all of these companies and examples have in common is they are building a more profitable company by doing something that their competitors have missed to actually make the world a safer, healthier, more equitable and sustainable planet. And that is the core of creating shared value. And I give you examples of big companies, but I know that much of the Africa economy depends on small enterprises, medium-sized enterprises, young entrepreneurs starting new businesses. And we see tremendous opportunities for new business ventures and small companies to find niches, to find new ways of doing business to address these problems. I'll give you a simple example. There's a company called Vision Spring, and they make eyeglasses. And of course, I'm wearing eyeglasses, as you can see. And when I go to get a new prescription, I have to go to an optometrist to get examined and then get a prescription and then go get the glasses. Well, most of the world has no access to optometrists, billions of people. And so the entrepreneur who started, started Vision Spring had a very simple idea. He said, you know, if we take two lenses and they are mirror images of each other and we align them so that they're perfectly aligned, they cancel each other out and they're just perfectly clear. But if we begin to slide them apart, you actually get a stronger and stronger prescription. And so he created eyeglasses with double lenses and a little dial on the side. You put on the eyeglasses, you turn the dial until things are in focus and you can see. And there are literally several billion people in the world who can buy those eyeglasses who couldn't before. That is the kind of entrepreneurship that makes money and scales up by solving social problems. So I said that shared value is not a crisis response mechanism, but how does it relate to the crisis and the world we're living in today? Well, I think it relates in several ways. 
first of all, it can be a source of inspiration for companies to find a social purpose and to rethink how they do business in a way that truly supports the society in which they operate. Second, I think it can be a guiding framework to show companies opportunities for where they can contribute best. And third, I think it helps define opportunities and point companies in the right direction for what they're trying to do. And just to give you a couple quick examples, I mentioned Walmart. They have become a real global leader in creating shared value. And the origin of it was a disaster. It was the floods and hurricanes in Katrina that damaged many parts of the south of the United States, caused loss of life, great painful struggles. And Walmart said to their employees in that region, do whatever it takes to be of help. We don't care about the cost. Just do whatever it takes. And they made a tremendous difference. And the employees were so proud that the CEO gathered people together virtually afterwards and said, what if we could feel the pride we feel today every day through everything we do? And that led them on a path that has made them a real leader in creating shared value. I said it can be a guiding framework. I'm writing a case now for Harvard Business School on a company, PayPal, that provides uh, transfers of payments between people or to pay for goods and services through your cell phone online. In the United States, in response to the COVID crisis, the government created a special program to get money to companies so that they could cover payroll. It was being administered by the banks, but they were overwhelmed with the demand and they were only serving their existing customers which meant that there were many, many small businesses that didn't have banking relationships, that didn't have access to these funds. Well, PayPal had a particular product aimed at providing credit to small businesses called PayPal Working Capital. It gave them credit instantly through their PayPal account. And they were able to get a billion and a half dollars out to hundreds of thousands of small businesses within a few days from this government program because they had created this product that filled a social need of providing credit to small business. The last example I want to mention is this idea of finding new opportunities. And I think they're about an example from National Australia Bank who completely changed their collections department. So instead of hammering on people to collect money they owed, they actually did the research to try and understand why were people falling behind on payments. And they found much like today, it had to do with sickness, it had to do with loss of a job, it had to do with personal yeah. circumstances yeah, that were painful. And so they said, yeah, um, I, I can hear you. Instead of just... Uh, Hi, can you? I, I'm sorry, I'm hearing some background noise. So uh, anyway, National Australia Bank said, look, instead of uh, just hammering on people to pay, these are good people and they actually want to pay. And what if we extend more credit to them and actually help them develop a workout plan so that they can get back to good standing? And within 90, day, within 90 days, 90% 90 of the people actually were back in good standing. And it has saved the bank $100 million a year in bad debt that they had not been able to collect before. So these are all examples of companies succeeding in new ways, creating more profit by actually helping to solve the social problem. And it's funny, the last few months, we've been spending a lot of work focusing on the investor side. Who are the owners of our companies? Do they understand this idea of creating shared value? And what we found is that most investors don't. They will 
look at companies and assess their environmental, social, and governance criteria, their ESG performance, but they don't actually connect that to the economic performance of the company. And as a result, they hinder companies from actually being able to create shared value. It's a really interesting example. We've been working with a company from Italy, an Italian company called Enel. They're the power company for Italy. And they have been moving steadily toward renewable energy to reduce their carbon footprint. And they've been very proud of this. And they've highlighted it in their sustainability report. They've talked about advancing the sustainable development goals. It's nearly a $100 billion company that is now more than 60% renewables. And it turns out the renewables are actually more profitable to operate than fossil fuel powered uh, power plants. And so what's the fascinating thing about this is they never said that to their investors. They were so focused on the idea that we're moving to renewables to make a better world that they forgot to mention to their shareholders that as they move toward more renewables, their profit margin will increase. And it's just an example of how so many business leaders around the world operate with two mindsets. There's the business mindset that ignores social problems and environmental problems, thinks those things get in the way of profit. And there's the social mindset, which thinks about philanthropy and sustainability and doing good and being nice and publishing wonderful reports. And they never put the two together and say, we can be a more successful company if we are more sustainable. But that is the core of this idea of creating shared value. And I think it creates an immense opportunity for Africa. Do not copy the US and Europe as you build your own economy. You will be the dominant economy in the world in years to come, but you have an opportunity to build a better economy, a more equitable economy, a more sustainable economy, a more resilient economy that avoids many of the problems that the rest of the world is struggling with today. And you can do that by thinking about this idea of creating shared value. And one of the real virtues of this idea of creating shared value is that everyone can contribute. It doesn't matter if you're working for a company, if you are a young entrepreneur, if you are working for an NGO, if you are working for government, if you are at a CEO level, or if you're at a more junior level. There are so many opportunities we have missed to rethink the way we operate our business to truly benefit all stakeholders in a way that gives us a better, more resilient, more profitable business model. And business can't do it without engaging good government, without working with NGOs and the nonprofit sector to help address some of these problems, to work with the sector that understands the needs of many people and the environmental needs of the world. And so whatever role you play in the world today, I ask you to step back and think about what is the social purpose that matters to you? And how can you bring that purpose to life through your work? How can you improve the company you work for in a way that makes it more competitive by delivering social benefits? 
if you are with an NGO, how can you partner with companies, not just to get a check for your work, that's important, but to actually find solutions that companies can profitably implement. Because if a company can do it at a profit, they can scale it up infinitely. And scale is the ultimate challenge we face when we are trying to confront social and environmental problems. And if your position is in the government or a development agency, how can you engage companies, not just to regulate them and prevent them from doing bad things, but to engage them as partners in finding solutions to our problems? So those are the thoughts I want to leave you with today. Africa is such a young and powerful continent. There is so much promise. The Africa Continental Free Trade Agreement, I think, is an important step in the right direction. But there is an opportunity for Africa to build an economy that is resilient, that is equitable that is sustainable and show the rest of the world how it ought to be done. Thank you, Professor Mark Kramer. That was an incredible speech. So many thoughts that come out of it. The first for me is the importance of connecting shared value to social realities right now. It was really, really important for me to hear you connect what is happening in America to the idea of shared value and leadership right now in 2020. The second insight that I think is critically important is, of course, to remind business that the idea of shared value is a business proposition. It would be fantastic if people act from motives that are virtuous motives. But this is not about ph philanthropy. This is not about ethics, although ethics is always good to have. But it is fundamentally about recognizing that your fate in terms of stakeholder theory is tied up in how everyone else is another stakeholder within the nexus between society and business cooperates to make sure that we maximize shareholder value. And for me, that's an insight that is so important when many people still wrongly think that shared value is just a synonym for philanthropy. And I think that was really important. And then lastly, it really is very important for me also as a citizen of this region to hear you take examples that demonstrate how it's not just the global north, but even in the global south that we can see companies like Discovery that are innovative and that can demonstrate how we can incentivize people to live better. That has a good social impact and it creates value that can then be shared. So some really amazing thoughts and many of the CEOs we're going to be chatting, out, chatting to throughout the day will be able to come back to those themes a little bit later. Later.